Sophia's War by Abby. Chapter 35 Think me not a bufflehead. I understood Mr. Townsend's meaning. He called himself a sleeping partner, a sly way of saying spy. Moreover, the way he referred to General Washington left me in no doubt for whom he was securing information. That said, I was astonished. I believed Mr. Townsend the tamest of men. Then I recalled how he listened and did not offer opinions like other men. But he did ask many questions. I now understood he lived the proverb, Wise heads have quiet tongues and eager ears. Yet that he revealed this to me, that he chose to connect me with what he was doing, and seemed to suggest that I too could be a spy, was extraordinary. To begin, it was considered base that anyone should do a low, dishonorable, deceitful thing as spy. How could I, a fifteen-year-old virtuous girl, act so? And the danger, the peril. More than three years had passed, but it took only an instant for me to recall Nathan Hale's death and Provost Cunningham's words to him. No Bibles for damned rebel spies. How well I remembered his words to me. Be still, Missy, or you'll come to the same fate. Most powerfully of all, I recalled William and his companions, the horrors of the sugar house and the good intent. I had heard that there were women prisoners on the prison ship Jersey. Would I risk all that? And yet it was those same appalling facts that reminded me of my profound craving to avenge such crimes. Thus, it must be said, when I grasped the implication of Mr. Townsend's words, a tremor of exhilaration passed through me. Did I not constantly chide myself about my unfulfilled vow to avenge my brother's death? Yet what had I done? Nothing. Did I not remind myself of our declaration and its list of British crimes? Was I not a patriot? Yet what had I done? Nothing. What of mother's strong words, that I must find my courage and use it? Yet what had I done? Nothing. Here at last was opportunity. But, come solutions, come quibbles. What if I were found out? Did I wish to practice such trickery? If caught, could I accept an end to life by hanging? Did I not have a responsibility toward my parents? What if they lost another child? Me. Who would care for them in a reduced state and in old age? What if I were unable to do what Mr. Townsend asked? What if I made hash of it all? Like bees upon the whitest flower, these questions swarmed around me. Of answers? I had none. Chapter 36 I walked home along Broadway, my head swirling with these hard thoughts. As if to tease me, the air was soft, almost sweet. But such was my agitated humor, I reminded myself that spring is most unpredictable. From somewhere I heard music playing. I soon discovered its origins when I went by the Trinity Church ruins. That evening it was a glow with candles and colored paper lanterns, a weekly event. While musicians played and armed soldiers kept mere citizens at bay, British and Hessian soldiers and their women danced about and on the old graves. To my sensibilities it was an image of what the British were doing to my country. How I despised them! Then, as I drew closer to home, a new question weighed upon me. Should I tell my parents what I was considering? I had no doubt that they would insist I not do what Mr. Townsend requested. I chose to say nothing. There! I chided myself. I am already deceiving my parents. At some point during the evening, our currently billeted officer, Captain Ponton, arrived. He was a loud, rude man, and I had no fondness for him. Moreover, that night he was somewhat bosky. After idle talk about how the British would soon trample Americans everywhere, he staggered up to his room. With him gone, my parents took themselves off. Happily, I was left alone with my mind. I sat there wondering what specifically Mr. Townsend would ask me to do. Would it be hard? Easy? 
How dangerous? Did I have the courage? At some point I heard a soft rapping on our door. Having dozed, I started. Picking up the low-burning candle, I went to the door, eased it open, and peeked out. A large man was standing on our step, cocked hat pulled down, partly concealing his face. I could see he was not clean, wore a rough jacket, baggy trousers, and muddy boots, and that he was looking at me with puzzlement as if he had, perhaps, come to the wrong door. Suddenly I recognized him. "'John Paulding?' I cried. "'Is that you?' I suspect you'll not recall the name. Mr. Paulding was William's friend, the one who urged him to join the army just before the battle in Brooklyn. The last time I'd seen him was when the two marched off together. And you are? Sophia Calderwood. Miss Calderwood, forgive me, you've quite grown. I reached to draw him inside. He held back. Is it safe to come in? We have a British officer forced upon us, I said. He pulled away. "'Can we go round back?' he asked. I nodded. As he retreated, I followed him, candle in hand. I found him sitting on the ground. I blew the candle out, knelt by his side, and poured out questions. "'Where have you come from? Where have you been? Why did you come?' He told me that ever since that battle in Brooklyn he'd been mostly with Washington's army, moving up and down the country. His stories were amazing and affecting. He had seen and done much. Only recently he had been posted to Westchester County, his native area, where he had been ordered to patrol what was called the Neutral Country. This was the area just north of Manhattan under the control of neither Patriot nor Tory. His task was to watch for pillaging Tories, called Cowboys, and prowling Redcoats. Being close to the city, he'd come to visit his intended wife, Miss Sarah Teed, whom he had not seen in many months. He was also determined to pay his respects to my parents. "'I'd heard of William's death some while ago,' he said. "'I've long wished to come, but I haven't been able. I'm awful sorry.' So it was that this night, knowing officers would be distracted by the Trinity dance, he slipped across the lines and made his way. "'Thank you,' I said. "'You were ever the good friend. Was it dangerous to come?' The neutral area is always infested with thieves, spies, as well as enemy soldiers. But, Miss Calderwood, I'm not sure I know what danger is any more. Tell me about William. Do you blame me for getting him to enlist? You were not the only one to urge him, and we were proud of him. I related to Mr. Paulding all that happened to cause his death. Though he knew about the sugar house and prison ships, William's story made him angry. You must, he said. Give your parents my condolences. He asked me about myself, but I spoke only about my work with Mr. Gain, nothing about Mr. Townsend's offer. He told me he needed to leave the city quickly, it being risky for him to stay. They would make short work of me if I were to be caught, but from this time forward, Miss Calderwood, he added earnestly, I beg you, consider me your brother. If ever you need anything, leave word for me at the place called Tarrytown. Though I could not imagine doing such a thing, I was touched. I thanked Mr. Paulding with all my heart. He, in turn, gave me a quick, brotherly embrace, and slipped into the night. Certain I would not see him again, I went to the common room and gave myself to my decision about Mr. Townsend. I do not mean to claim that Mr. Paulding's coming that night caused me to make up my mind. No more than did seeing those officers dance upon the sacred graves at Trinity Church, or Captain Ponton's crude and tipsy remarks, only that they proved very timely. Perhaps, as it said, coincidences are God's small messages. Surely, if Mr. Paulding could expose himself to so much danger on behalf of our country, if William could give his life, if Nathan Hale could give his... If I must witness British officers dance upon our graves, how dare I do nothing? Need I remind you, I had reason, and motive enough. All these things gave blood to my heart. Thus I made up my mind. I would join Robert Townsend. I would become a spy. Chapter 37 
Next morning I went off to Hanover Square. For most of the day I worked setting lines of advertising type. Dull work indeed, and tedium agitates the soul. My mind spun about the questions I would pose to Mr. Townsend. It was late afternoon when he appeared. When he came in he did not even look at me, but conversed with Mr. Gain about small matters. Perhaps Mr. Townsend had changed his mind. Part of me wished he had. At length, however, Mr. Townsend turned to me, bowed. Miss Calderwood, good afternoon. Curtsy. Good afternoon, sir. Might you wish a word with me? Mr. Gain shifted round so deliberately I was sure he understood what was afoot. Yes, sir, I replied. Mr. Gain removed his leather apron and said, Forgive me, Mr. Townsend, I've, I've got me a small errand. Miss Calderwood, be so good as to look after. Yes, sir, I replied, certainly did not wish to hear my conversation with Mr. Townsend. Indeed, within moments that gentleman turned to me and said, Miss Calderwood, have you come to a decision? I said, I wish to help. Bravo. But, Mr. Townsend, I said in haste, I first need to know how you intend to make use of me. There is a house-servant position available in the British headquarters at Number 1 Broadway. I've been asked to find a young woman to take on the chores there. But how could my being a house-servant help? Within such a place there must be much unguarded talk, papers left about, the like. All you need do is look and listen, an opportunity not to be missed. Anything you believe is significant you shall convey to me. No more, no less. Won't they discover me? The world being what it is, Miss Calderwood, your being a girl shall mask your true occupation. Nothing he said could have excited me more. Can you really place me in the position? I am on good terms with someone in the household. Not that they know me, as you do. So yes. No sooner confronted with reality than I felt queasy. I turned my back on him and thought of ways to wiggle free. Oh, one problem, sir. My parents depend upon my wages. What... Ever you earn here, Miss Calderwood, you will receive the same amount. I will answer for it. He would say no more, but waited. As for me, I could think of no other rational objections to Mr. Townsend's offer, save fright, which I was not prepared to admit. When would I begin? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Our need for information is urgent. We don't wish to lose any opportunity. Mr. Townsend? I abruptly asked. How did you come to this employment? Did you ever hear of Nathan Hale? Startled, I could only stare. When Hale died, General Washington established a scheme of spies. Mr. Payne's words recruited me. Leaving me to assume the rest, Mr. Townsend asked, Are you still willing? I said, How secret shall this be? Only you, Miss Calderwood, and I shall know. But, Mr. Gain, he brushed the question aside with a wave of his hand. Now then, he hurried on, tomorrow morning at eight o'clock you shall meet me outside the Archibald Kennedy House, number one Broadway. Feeling rushed, I found another excuse. But if I do discover something, how can I inform you? You shall leave notes for me, under the name Culper, at the King's Crown. That's why I wished you to see it. Have you other questions? I could think of none. Then we agree. I think I nodded. Oh, fateful nod. It was then he added, I must give you one warning. This is a dangerous thing I, and now you, will be doing. To be found out could be fatal. It's best to be skittish. From time to time I might even find it best to withdraw. That means there may be times you will be without me. And if I am? You will need to make decisions on your own. Can you do that? What could I say other than, I think so? Then, till tomorrow. That said, Mr. Townsend left me. At home that night my talk was so small that Mother wanted to know if I was ill. I assured her I was fine. Indeed, out of a sense of obligation, I might be taken and held without their knowing, I finally blurted out what I was about to do. As I expected, my parents were appalled, urged me not to. 
spoke of it as folly, danger. As my parents, they ordered me not to. Their opposition became my strength. To every argument, fear, and threat, my only answer was, I'm doing it for William, his comrades. I would not be turned. Not as strong as I, they eventually gave up. Oh, you who would prefer weak parents, think again. I spent a tossing night wondering about all that might happen. How would I comport myself? Was I capable of deception? Would I know what information was of value? What way would I convey that information to Mr. Townsend? Why use a false name, Culper, for messages? He hinted he might have to withdraw for a while. Would I, if necessary, be able to deal alone? Would Mr. Townsend really give the information I provided to General Washington? How would he do so? I had no answer to such questions. Moreover, it came to me that the oft-used symbol for Great Britain was a lion, and that on the morrow I was going to place myself in the beast's great sharp-toothed jaws. Chapter 38 I awoke before I needed to. I breakfasted and hurried to market for mother. Happily, I had no papers to deliver for father. Without further words to my stony-faced parents, I walked to Number 1 Broadway. The city knew no grander building than the one known as the Archibald Kennedy House. A large two-story, plus attic, brick building. It was almost sixty feet wide at the street. On each of the two main floors were four big windows, all with shutters. The entryway was a massive white door reached by four stone steps, the door bracketed with stately wooden and fluted columns. The closer I came to this commanding structure, the more my resolution shrank. Did I really wish to commit myself to such an outrageous act? To be a spy? When I stood before the building and saw two tall British guards, one on each side of the front door, standing at fierce attention, bayoneted muskets in hand, I struggled to maintain my resolve. Even as I observed it all, other soldiers, they appeared to be officers, were entering and leaving the house. Miss Calderwood. Startled, I looked around. It was Mr. Townsend. We need to go round the back, he said quietly. Led by him, I went down an alley on the north side of the building. At the rear was a low door, the servant's entrance, but guarded as out front by two soldiers. Mr. Townsend approached them. One of the soldiers seemed to recognize him. We're here to see Mrs. Benjamin. Very good, Mr. Townsend. The soldier saluted Mr. Townsend, but took no notice of me. It made me recall Mr. Townsend's remark that your being a girl shall mask your true occupation. Now, folly, not occupation, seemed a better word. The other soldier opened the door for us. We stepped down into a spacious kitchen with an immense hearth and stone floor as well as tables, cabinets, and large basins. On one wall bright copper pots were shelved in orderly fashion. Others hung from the ceiling, barrels stood about containing I knew not what. On the massive central table mounds of vegetables, a large fish, a side of beef plus loaves of bread. Considering the city's shortage of food, it was astonishing to see such abundance. It filled me with resentment and stiffened my resolve. Three women were hard at work preparing food. Two were young, and the third was a large, elder woman, who turned to greet us. Ah, Mr. Townsend, good day. Mrs. Benjamin, this is the girl I spoke to you about. I curtsied as the woman eyed me up and down. Very well, said Mrs. Benjamin. We can try her. Miss, if you would sit there, I'll send for Mrs. Ticknor. She's chief housekeeper. She'll inform you of your duties. Mr. Townsend, she said, much obliged. To her, he said, I'll send that cloth you requested to your home. To me, he said nothing, but gave me his customary brief bow and departed. I took the chair where I'd been directed and waited. One of the younger women left the room, presumably to fetch that Mrs. Tickner. Since Mrs. Benjamin and the other young woman paid no further notice of me, I sat there trying to take in as much as I could while pondering the notion that in exchange for a bolt of cloth I had been engaged as a spy. I was still sitting there, waiting, when into the room stepped John Andre. 
Chapter 39 My heart lurched. My throat tightened. I could hardly breathe. All I did was gawk at him. As for John Andre, he went right to Mrs. Benjamin and spoke about some special guests to be at that night's dinner with General Clinton. A discussion of the menu ensued. At one point he casually glanced round the room and rested his eyes on me. Did he recognize me? I saw not so much as a glimmer of notice in his eyes. No, he knew me not. No more than had John Paulding. Once a girl, now a woman. What better disguise? Next instant he turned away, finished talking, then left. The kitchen resumed what it had been doing before. Mrs. Benjamin, I said when I could carry on with normal breathing. That officer who was just here, who is he? Major Andre? He's General Henry Clinton's chief of staff, just back from Charleston. Next to His Excellency the General, he's the most powerful man here. Is he a major, then? And soon to be promoted higher, they say? What are his duties? Lord, what doesn't he do? Schedules the General's appointments and sees everyone who comes, receives and answers the General's letters, approves sick leave, writes reports for the General? In all of General Clinton's decisions he has a part. And, so it said, he's Scoutmaster. Scoutmaster? You know, the word they use for the one in charge of intelligence, spies and the like. I dare say our army has a host of them, and the rebels, I suppose, have theirs. Major Andre is not only in charge of our spies, he's supposed to catch the rebel ones. Chapter 40 just before, my heart had been beating wildly. Now I truly believed it had stopped altogether. "'Very well, then,' Mrs. Benjamin went on without noticing my reaction. "'What name do you wish to be called?' "'Who thinks about one's choice of name? But somehow I managed to find tongue enough to give my mother's name. "'Molly,' I managed to say. "'Molly Seville.' Mrs. Tickner arrived in the kitchen. She was a small, plump, red-faced, middle-aged woman, bursting with much forcibility. Despite her size, the woman attended to her duties like a barn swallow, forever swooping here and there and everywhere. In her charge were nine housemaids, first and second floor, of which I was the newest. "'Never forget,' she prattled rapidly as she gave me a tour, "'this house is the most important in the city, and I dare say in the country.' His Excellency General Henry Clinton insists that things be done to perfection. From floor to ceiling, wealth and fashion gilded every inch of the headquarters. The outsized rooms all had fireplaces with marble mantles, stylish chairs with tapestry backings and cushions, as well as graceful tables on thick rugs. Crystal chandeliers loaded with bayberry candles dangled from the ceilings. Upon the walls hung portraits of bewigged and bemetalled military men who gazed condescendingly down from their perches. The top floor housed General Clinton's living quarters. I was instructed that I was a first-floor girl and not to go where I was not asked. During my time there I generally did not know the general was about unless I heard him playing his violin in his private quarters. The first-floor up-front rooms were the dining room and parlor. The parlor served as a waiting room for those who came to call upon the general. Indeed, there were crowds of such visitors, officers, government men and merchants, morning, noon, and night. Dinners were as elaborate as they were late. My tasks, as Mrs. Tickner unfolded them, appeared endless, polishing windows, floors, and door locks, dusting picture frames, mantles, desks, and chairs. I was to serve food, take dishes away, and when called upon, wash linens, napkins, and the like. In short, I must do whatever I was told. Further, I was to be in the house no later than six in the morning and would be released only in the evenings until I was no longer needed. On that first floor in the back was the commander-in-chief's office. Directly across the hallway with special access was John Andre's place of work. Mrs. Tickner stopped before the door and announced, I need to show you Major Andre's office. Cleaning it will be a key part of your duties. Alarm enveloped me. What if he is there? What if this time he recognizes me? All the same, I wished to see it, the more so when Mrs. Tickner, hand on the doorknob, spoke with reverence. You must pay attention to the Major. He's risen swiftly and will go far. 
Everyone acknowledges he's that rarity, a favorite of General Clinton. The two confer about everything. Indeed, they say nothing happens in this house to which the Major is not a party. She lowered her voice. The power behind the throne. But for all his importance, she went on, the Major is courteous, and, while firm, doesn't seek fault. His friendly and ungrudging ways have made him a favorite of the staff. We all dearly love him. I'm sure you will, too. Why did that give me a pinch of pain? She knocked. My heart was knocking, too, and upon receiving no answer, opened the door. I was thankful, or was I disappointed, the room was deserted. I examined it. There was a large table in the center of his room, a chair behind it, two chairs before. Upon the table were many papers. A few lay spread about, but most were in neat stacks. Writing quills stuck up from a wide-mouthed jar next to an inkwell and a box of blotting sand. On one wall, a portrait of someone in an elegant uniform. Mostly, however, the walls bore pinned-up maps more than I had ever seen. As for what places they represented, I could not say. Like every other room in the house, it had a large fireplace, but this being summer, no fire was laid. I did note that André's flute lay upon the mantel. Recalling how he used to play for me, it was impossible not to have emotioned thoughts. I did my first dusting while denying them away. "'He's been working hard of late,' Mrs. Tickner went on, her voice ripe with respect. "'He arrives in his office before the general and stays much later. It shall be your responsibility to get here in the morning each day, before he does, to tidy.' Mrs. Tickner said no more, but, putting a dustcloth in my hand, set me to polishing brass fixtures in the dining room. As I went about my tasks that first day, I tried to speculate what kind of information might be in those papers I had seen on Major André's desk. If this was the most important house in the city, and nothing happens in this house to which the Major is not a party, his office must contain a trunk of useful intelligence. It was my task to unpack those things, not to engage with the Major. End Chapter 40